Hi guys, welcome back to the Library of Alan and today guys, today is yet another extremely late wrap up. Why on earth can't I get these out at the beginning of the month uh, rather than the middle of the month after I have forgotten all of the things that I read in the previous month. So this is February's wrap up, even though it is March 18th probably, which is actually my 39th birthday because I am an old man. So, February was a weird reading month. It was kind of a strange, like, I don't know, it was a stressful month just in general. And it, it seemed like this malaise kind of bled over to a lot of people. Like, a lot of people suffered this weird reading slumpish kind of time in February. I know I certainly did. I only read four books um, for a total of around slightly less than like 2,000 words, but right around 2,000, not 2,000 two words. Oh my gosh, like, what is, like I read, like that's not even a novella, 2,000 words, like a, like a picture book. 2,000 pages, around 2,000 pages, but the quality of those books uh, was pretty good because I read one four-star book and then three five-star books. Guys, I have had just an amazing reading year so far. I've had nothing but five-star reads plus one four-star and then one DNF. And that's it. The rest have been five stars. I've just, I've just loved every stinking thing that I have read. So, without wasting any more time, let's get down to business. Let's get started on the books that I read in February. So, my four-star read for this month was Boosh. Red Rising by Pierce Brown. And this began our Feb Rising read along over um, on my Discord. And guys, we had a blast like reading, reading this, discussing it in the Discord. And then we had an amazing live show with Pete from Ponderings of Pete, uh, Christy Lewis from Dusty Rescue in Space, and Leslie from The Nerdy Narrative. The three of us, or the four of us, just had a great discussion about Red Rising and it was super fun. So if you missed that, please, should, please be sure to check that out here. And I actually really enjoyed Red Rising. I didn't like it that much at the beginning. First of all, it's first person present tense, which I already is like don't love. It's not my favorite. And the writing was really choppy for me. It took about a hundred pages for me to get into it and be like, oh, okay, this is something that I enjoy. And Red Rising, if you don't know, is about a society that is segmented um, by caste system and the caste systems are color coded and each color kind of serves its own purpose. Everything is very like each according to his ability, each according to his need kind of thing. But uh, the golds are at the the very top. They're genetically bred to be bigger, stronger, faster, smarter, and they kind of run everything. And they've, you know, um, it, it takes place on our world, but in the far distant future where, you know, they've colonized everything from the moon all the way to Pluto. And, and the golds are in charge. And at the bottom are the reds and they mine some sort of gas and they're treated like, they're, I mean, they're, they're, I mean, hardly better than serfs really. And then you have other, you have other various colors that, you know, perform other things like the obsidians are like the thugs. They're the, they're the weaponry, I guess. They're, they're just the, they have six fingers on each hand. <laughs> well, like, why? I think it's six fingers. They have more than five fingers on each hand and they're bred that way. Are you, like, are you genetically, like, d does having more fingers make you a better fighter? Like, does it? Like, I, I like, I get like having like four arms, It'd be like Goro from Mortal Kombat. <laughs> I mean, but, <laughs> Like, how does an extra finger make you better if I, I don't know. Anyway, there it is. Um, but this is a story very much about revenge. Uh, the inciting incident happens pretty early on, and our buddy Darrow is set out to take revenge on the golds and on society. A lot more than that is really kind of spoilers for, like, but, I mean, that's the thing. Anyway, they end up, there's a Hunger Games kind of aspect. Uh, a lot of people refer to this as Hunger Games in space. Some of that is true. Um, it's much more murdery than Hunger Games, and it's it's much more war games than like survivalist kind of thing. Um, but I really, really enjoyed it. I think some of the relationships are really believable. I loved Pierce. Pierce Brown is very clearly uh, a student of antiquity, and it pleases me greatly to see all of these Greek and Roman references just from everyone's name to, I mean, they talk about a goge, which is like the, you know, the Spartan kind of training. Um, they reference Alcibiades. Who, like, who references Alcibiades? Like, are you serious? Who was an Athenian, like, quadruple agent, really? Uh, uh, super interesting. Super interesting is Alcibiades. During the Peloponnesian War, adopted son of Pericles, probably the greatest statesman that ever lived, really. Certainly the greatest Athenian statesman. And anyway, it's all very, very interesting. And, I mean, it's just, like, I don't know how this got labeled YA ever. There is so much death and so much murder in this. It's pretty violent. Anyway, super, super good. And it has a lot of things to say about power, about um, 
you know, about the, they call the noble lie. Democracy is the noble lie where, you know, we pretend that, you know, everybody's created equal. Yeah, but I mean, you know, like I am not equal to my buddy in studying finance. And so that's what, it, that's what it's like. The golds have just like popped that up on steroids and they now, you know, put people in caste system based on that kind of thing. But it's just very interesting study in what power is and power politics and all of those kind of things. And so uh, I just didn't enjoy the beginning enough, but, but four stars, definitely. I really, really enjoyed this. Um, I am starting Golden Sun really today and that will continue. And the live show for Golden Sun will be at the end of this month and uh, Joanna and Vish and Charmaine will all three be joining me as we discuss Golden Sun. So please make sure to check that out. My first five star book of the month was Boosh, The Iliad by Homer and translated by Robert Fagel. So I read this as part of um, the Year of Short Classics over on Andy Smith's channel uh, where he ha is reading a classic every month and has a live show host and it was Iliad and the host was me because I have done a one man show of the Iliad I am a classics student, I'm a classics teacher, etc. And so it was really, really fun getting to read the Iliad again. I'll link the live show here. It's super exciting, guys. Like, even if you haven't read the Iliad, the Iliad is not really a book that you need to read to be able to talk about, really, unless you want to talk about it in, like, you know, fine nuance and depth. But overall, like, if you just know the Iliad is, is, is about the Trojan War and really about uh, the internal conflict between uh, Achilles, who cannot master his rage, and Hector and their conflict. In fact, the book ends with the burial of Hector, and that's where the Iliad ends, even though Troy hasn't even been burned yet, and Achilles is still alive and all that good stuff. So please check out that live show. It's super, super interesting stuff, and I love talking to Andy. Andy, thank you so much for having me on your channel to do that. Now, this particular translation by Robert Fagels, I love because of the musicality of it. He uses a lot of assonance, a lot of alliteration, and really pulls out a a, uh, a lyrical kind of translation for it. And that is why I like the Robert Fagel's translation so much. Um, the, the Fitzgerald translation was really kind of the standard for a long time. And there are several other prose translations as well if you want to read it kind of in story format instead of more lyrical. But I think the Fagel's translation just works super, super well. Le I want to read some like choice passages of what I'm talking about. And so this part, Patroclus is wearing the armor of Achilles because Achilles refuses to fight because he's a big crybaby. Like, Achilles, get over it, man. And so Patroclus is out there fighting and I just, I love this passage of um, the description of Patroclus and his men and his Myrmidons, really Achilles' uh, best soldiers. Hungry as wolves that rend and bolt raw flesh, hearts filled with battle frenzy that never dies, off on the cliffs ripping apart some big antlered stag, they gorge on the kill till all their jaws drip red with blood. Then down in a pack they lope to a pooling dark spring, their lean sharp tongues lapping the water's surface, belching bloody meat, but the fury never shaken builds inside their chests, though their glutted bellies burst. And like that is so evocative of just this pack of wolves that has just gorged themselves on so much like just carry on that they're just bloated with it. Oh, oh so good. So good. Right, I'm reading this section for you as well. Uh, Achilles has just like after Patroclus dies that stirs him to finally freaking do something. And he goes out and he fights Hector and he stabs Hector in the throat. And so, you know, he's gloating over Hector. So godlike Achilles gloried over him. Hector! Surely you thought when you stripped Patroclus' armor that you, you would be safe. Never a fear of me far from the fighting as I was, you fool. Left behind there, down by the beaked ships, his great avenger waited, a greater man by far. That man was I, and I smashed your strength. And you, the dogs and birds, will maul you, shame your corpse, while Achaeans bury my dear friend in glory. And at struggling for breath, Hector, his helmet flashing, said, I beg you. I beg you by your life, your parents. Don't let the dogs devour me by the Argive ships. Wait, take this princely ransom of bronze and gold, the gifts my father and noble mother will give you, but give my body to friends to carry home again, so Trojan men and Trojan women can do me honor with fitting rites of fire once I am dead. Staring grimly, the proud runner Achilles answered, Beg no more, you fawning dog, begging me by my parents. Oh, would to God my rage, my fury would drive me now to hack your flesh away and eat you raw. Such agonies you have caused me. Ransom, 
No man alive could keep the dog packs off you, not if they haul in ten, twenty times that ransom and pilot here before me and promise fortunes more. No, not if, not even if Dard and Priam should offer to weigh out your bulk and gold. Not even then will your noble mother lay you on your deathbed, mourn the son she bore. The dogs and birds will rend you, blood and bone. At the, at the point of death, Hector, his helmet flashing, said, I know you well. I see my fate before me. Never a chance that I could win you over. Iron inside your chest, that heart of yours. But beware, or my curse will draw God's wrath upon your head. That day when Paris and Lord Apollo, for all your fighting heart, destroy you at the Skian gates. Death cut him short. The inn closed in around him. Flying free of his limbs, his soul went winging down to the house of death, wailing his fate, leaving his manhood far behind, his young and supple strength. But brilliant Achilles taunted Hector's body, dead as he was. Die! Die! For my own death I'll meet it freely whenever Zeus and the other deathless gods would like to bring it on. And then he like just completely like just desecrates Hector's corpse and drags it round and round the city of Troy for 10 days. Anyway, exciting stuff. Five stars. I love the Iliad. So, you know, I was probably prone to giving it five stars. The next book of the month that I gave five stars to is Boosh, The Fifth Element by Sir Terry Pratchett. So the fifth elephant is book five of the City Watch subseries of Discworld. And I mean, it's great. Like, it's so good. It's, it's, it is the least funny of the five guards books, but it is also one of the most rich in character development, especially concerning uh, Lady Sybil Rampkin and her relationship with Commander Vimes. This takes place in Uberwald, which is kind of a Transylvania uh, kind of place where there are vampires and werewolves and deep dwarves, like dwarves that are, are very conservative in the old ways that don't really, they don't like Ankh-Morpork Pork and they don't want their, uh, their kids going to Ankh-Morpork Pork and learning the non-dwarvish ways. They're much, they're very, much more secluded people than the city dwarves. And it's just, I mean, it's just great. It has so much to say about uh, diplomacy and and what it means to be a superpower negotiating with these less civilized powers. There's a bad guy in it who constantly calls Vimes civilized. Like that's his, the name he uses for him. He's like, are you tired yet civilized? Because it's really kind of mocking the fact that Ankh-Morpork Pork is there to kind of civilize this backwoods, uh, kind of more savage, wild, untamed place called Uberwald. And there's this just this great debate between the law, which Vimes and the Watch and uh, more pork kind of stand for and the lore which is this very like wild untamed mythic kind of thing like everything everybody knows about werewolves uh, they behave according to the lore as opposed to vimes and his watchmen who behave according to the law so it's very very good and just like these 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 themes here civilized versus uncivilized and the relationships uh not just between Vimes and Sybil, but also between Angua and Carrot. And so it's just really, really good. I remember not liking this book as much, maybe because it wasn't as funny last time, but I really, really enjoyed this book this past time when I read it last month. I have a full review of this if you are interested, but I am super excited to read Night Watch next month and continue on with my reread of these watch books. Now, before I get to the last book, the last five-star book and the best book I read of uh, in February, I want to talk about last month I talked talked about um, some of the games that I played as well. So I'm just going to kind of do a wrap up of the other things that I was doing in this month. And uh, so last month I played 13 Sentinels, I guess Rim, and it was just an excellent sci-fi, like just a really, really good sci-fi story. Well, this, this month I played uh, Assassin's Creed 4, Black Flag, not great story-wise, but it is the pirate one, and I love pirates. <laughs> is without doubt the worst pirate I have ever seen. And it was the most fun to play. I think the combat is best in the third one, but the setting of the revolution is kind of like, I mean, it's all right, but a pirate setting? Guys, I spent so much time just sailing around on my freaking galleon, like attacking other ships and plundering them, and really just sailing around, listening to my guys sing sea shanties, like, what would you do with a drunken sailor? What would you do with a drunken sailor? What do you do with a drunken sailor? Early in the morning. Is without doubt the worst pirate I have ever seen. That and that's a lie, that's a lie, that's a lie, lie, lie. 
is without doubt the worst pirate I have ever seen. And it just cycles through all these sea shanties. I would just sail around and tell my guys to sing. And you know what? It was delightful. I can think of few better ways to spend a day than sailing around pawn a galleon listening to melody of sea shanties sung by Dirty Scalawags. Oh, you young sailor, then listen to me. You a song of the fish in the sea and it's windy weather, boys, stormy weather, boys, pendulum coast, we're all together. So it was super fun. Um and then, because I'm a trophy fiend, I had to grind out to level 55 uh, on multiplayer, which was just a complete drag. Do y'all remember those, those days, like what, a decade ago or so, maybe 15 years or so, when every bleeding game thought it needed to have a multiplayer, and then they attached trophies and achievements to the multiplayer? Like, who cares? Like, stop. Not all of us want to be cussed at by Toby, 13 years old, in his mama's basement. Go eat dinner, Toby! Like, it's just, ugh. Like, I don't like playing online with strangers, so please, but fortunately we're past that and developers are like, oh, people do like playing games that have good stories on their own. We can stop wasting time adding multiplayers to role-playing games. Anyway, um, I also been watching an anime called When They Cry. Have y'all seen this anime? I'm not done. I've only finished the first season. What is happening? Also, do not watch this if you do not like scary things or gory things or are squeamish as far as people being brutally murdered? Like, what is, I, I have no idea what's happening in this. There is some curse in this village where every time they have the cotton drifting festival, I mean, what, what a boring festival name, people get murdered, like people die, and they get brutally murdered and people disappear, and it's just, I don't, I don't even know what's happening. It is super weird and it is super, it is, it is really, really violent, and I'm not sure how to weigh in on it yet. Everything I've seen has told me to like, you know, you gotta keep watching it, everything gets revealed. And so I'm hoping that that will eventually happen. And so I can, because right now I'm just like, why, why would anybody watch this? Like, I wouldn't recommend this to anybody. Like, what's happening? What is going on in this freaking anime? Anyway, if you've seen When They Cry, does it, like, does it get better as I watch the whole thing? Please let me know. So, my last five-star book of the month and my favorite book of the month, boom, here is this bind up for the last time, Price of Spring by Daniel Abraham, book four of the Long Price Quartet. Guys, there's, no, there's a review coming up of this, and I know no, one, no one's going to be able to watch it because it's going to be a spoiler talk because you have to talk spoilers of this at this point. Guys, the Long Price Quartet. Guys, this part of the video is brought to you by Crap I've Already Said, but this book is just so, it's so different, and I read a lot of the reviews, and a lot of the reviews, and uh, um, Adrian from my Discord, who had just finished reading the series and loves it just like I do and oh it's amazing. He said he probably would not have liked this book 10 years ago and you know what I probably wouldn't have either. There's something about I don't know being older and just watching these two got a book fell. Watching these two guys over like you know over really their entire lives from children to senior citizens and just watching how choices that you make when you're a teenager can have ripple effects all the way through your life and how do you end up like how you end up paying for those mistakes and how you grow and learn from those or try to fix them and it's just it's abraham it's just it's, just, it's brilliant like it's so hard to talk about i just need more people to read this it is the the conclusions are quietly explosive just incredible character work uh, between the, the friends and, and their wives and their children and just it's this, this really interesting world that feels very real but also extremely dangerous and you feel for these characters. I've said it before and again, crap I've said already, this is Shakespearean in its level of tragedy. These characters are so real and we understand them even after we, we even as we are screaming saying please Please do not make the decisions that you are about to make. I get why you're gonna do it, and I get why you think that's a good idea. But please don't. I'm begging you. I'm begging you. Please don't make that decision. And it's just, it's just so good. It's just so good. So The Price of Spring is the conclusion of what is left up. It deals with the aftermath. It's, it's 14 years after uh, Autumn War. It deals with the very, very difficult aftermath of that third book. 
as people try to fix their mistakes. And it's like, I can't even say anything about it. It's the fourth book and you can't, you don't wanna give anything away with Autumn War. It's just, it's just amazing. It's just so, it's so, so good. And it was such a perfect, perfect ending to this long tale that began with Shadow and Summer. And the last two books, as I've said before, books three and four just elevate books one and two. Abraham is just telling a complete tale from beginning to end. And it's just so good. It's just a tragic tale of grief and loss and love and friendship and relationships and family. And it's just, uh, it's just so good. It's so good. It's so good. Like this is the series that I will definitely reread and it is certainly in my top favorite series of all time now. So guys, that is it for me. As always, information about my Patreon and Discord is down in the descriptions and guys, I'll see you next time.